It's, it's wonderful to be here. Um, today, I, I'm, I'm hoping uh, to, to, the first part of it, I'm hoping to, it's going to be a little bit theoretical, but I believe always in doing something practical, so uh, we're, we're going to do something practical in the second part of it, and, um, and so I'm going to need your help. I'm going to need your interaction. Um, so let's, let's get started. Uh, hope trending, uh, we're going to be talking about uh, millennials here, and um, one of the things I want you to notice is how, how do we, re- we reach younger generations in practical ways? Um, and and how, do we, how do we do that departing from our own generational assumptions? And how can we use these assumptions to create safe places for our millennials? Now, millennials are between ni- the, the, ni- the early 1980s and the early 2000s. So there's a lot of us here who are not millennials at all. And we're not going to be able to think like millennials. We're not going to be able to see like millennials or, or experience like millennials. So, so we're, we're trying to just, you know, put on their, their glasses and trying to say, okay, let's, let's do this this way. Um, we're, we're going to fail. You know, we, ha- we, have to, we have to approach from a different perspective and be facilitators and be mentors in this process. And so um, what I want to do is, I want to, I, want to, I want to do a reality check very fast. First reality check. It seems that our culture will continue to experience a decrease in nominal Christianity and increase in nuns. The nuns are people who don't believe in absolutely nothing. They just gave up on everything. Okay? So, and this, in the con- I'm talking in this context is the U.S. And there's a possibility that it may or may not apply here in Australia. The other thing, the other reality check is our culture will continue to be dominated by secular people, both in worldview and in numbers. And, and that's, that's happening more and more in the, in the U.S., and I, I know probably you guys are participating in that as well. Now, this one catches a lot of my attention. Notice, our culture will continue to experience a rise in religious pluralism, where Christianity will increasingly become one voice among a sea of competing voices, a narrative. And that's where we as a church are in denial, may I say. And uh, we're, 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 what, we're not, what we're not understanding is that we're going back to the Old Testament setting. Remember the Old Testament? A bunch of gods. And among the gods, there was this one that was called Yahweh, the God of who? Israel, right? Man, there's a reason why those phrases are in the Bible. The God of Israel. In the ancient Near East, there's a, there's a sea of gods. A sea of gods. And among all the narratives of religions and ways, there's this way that is the God, the true God, Yahweh, who Israel claimed. And we're going back to that setting very fast. It just doesn't look like it. We, we, you know, we're not fighting you know, with, with spears. We're fighting with other stuff. But um, what's interesting about this is that it... it, it, it it, it then it has to challenge us, you know. It challenges because it's not just about preaching something that is right. With a millennial, I can say, hey, the Sabbath is the right day. And I can prove it to you. Look in my Bible. I can show you all the text. This is the Sabbath. It's the right day of worship. And the millennial will be like, so what? That doesn't matter. It's just a narrative, and good for you, you know, that you can prove it. The question that they're going to ask is, how does it affect you? Does it make you happy? Does it, does it make your family happy? Does, the, does it make your lifestyle happier? Is, is it more healthier for you? Does it, give it, does it give it a better view of the world? Does it allow you to love other people? That's the question that they're going to ask. These things that you believe, this narrative that you believe in, does it really affect your life or is it just, is just some theory that you're throwing at me? You see? And so when I say that God loves all people, and then at the, at the, at the, at the entrance of the, of, the, of the church, somebody who looks weird comes in and we say, hey, uh, you can't come in here like that. Then the narrative doesn't make sense to them. It's just theory. You can't say God loves people and then say, some people need to leave this building right now. For them, that doesn't make sense. It's, it's, it's hypocrisy in their eyes, you see? And so this, this, this narrative, we, we as a Seventh-day Adventist church, we have a beautiful, powerful, amazing, gut-wrenching 
narrative. It's, it's just full of passion and grace and love and, and, and moves for justice. And, and it's just amazing. And, and this is the narrative that we have to offer to them. But we need to learn how we can share this narrative with them. In Exodus chapter 25, I like this because Exodus 25 verse 8 presents our narrative. And let them make me a what? A sanctuary that they, I may dwell among them. Now, last night I, I was able to speak the second part of this verse to my crowd, um, with the high schoolers. But I want to share with you the first part of this, this narrative. Um, and, and, the, and the word I want to focus on, sanctuary. Sanctuary, the word for sanctuary in Hebrew is mikdash. And verse 9 is going to be mishkan. It's a different word. The word in, in, in verse 8 has to do more with presence than structure. The word in verse 9 has to do more with structure than presence. And in verse 8, the sense of this word is that it's moving. It's moving. This presence, it just moves, right? And it not only moves, it invades. And it invades darkness. A good example of that, you guys can look that up later. A good example of that invasion of darkness is in, in, in Ezekiel chapter 11, verse 16. Ezekiel chapter 11, verse 16, God is speaking to a people that have had done wrong to him. They're going into exile. And he says, I'm going to scatter you throughout all these nations. And I will go with you as a little sanctuary, Migdash. I love that. God invades our darkness. So, uh, you know, the psalmist speaks about that concept, where should I flee from your presence? Where should I go, Lord? Psalms 139. If I go here, you're there. If I go here, you're there. If I go here, you're there. Even if I go into the darkness, your light shines. So this presence of God is a presence that is dynamic, that moves, that invades, and is not afraid of the darkness of this world. It's not afraid of it. And so we have a beautiful example in the New Testament. In the New Testament, we have two temples, by the way. And in the New Testament, we have the Herodian temple, and then we have Jesus. And I love, I love Jesus because Jesus is the Midash that moves dynamically and invades. And notice, who is Jesus spending time with? Spending time with those who are broken or hurt, who are messed up. He's spending time with these people who are rejected, pushed away. That's who the people that Jesus is spending time with. And the Pharisees, who are representatives of the Herodian temple, are like, what's going on with this guy? It's not supposed to be this way. You see, so this incarnational mode, this dwelling among the people, this dwelling is very important. If we go back to Exodus chapter 25, that word for dwell right there, if you, if you remember the, 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 the camp, the sanctuary smack in the middle, and the Israelite lives ordinary life in the presence of God. So not only we have a presence that invades invades darkness, that is movable, that is dynamic, now we have a presence. And it's interesting that this ordinary life, think about it, ordinary life, they, they did all sorts. Today, let's imagine today this was the camp of Israel. You woke up today, and what did you do? The first thing you did when you woke up. You probably, even, you probably kneeled down and prayed. You probably just woke up and went straight to the bathroom because you drank a bottle of water last night. You probably, you probably were, were brushing your teeth. You, you probably were combing your hair because you have, there's these things, that, or you were prepping stuff. All these things happened in God's presence. Ordinary life happened in God's presence. So they worshipped in God's presence, but they also sinned in God's presence. And you have to ask the question, why? Why would God allow that? It's because only in God's presence is where true transformation happens. Not away from God's presence, but in God's presence is where true transformation happens. So imagine a presence that is dynamic, that invades darkness, but also transforms every place where it goes. That's amazing. Now get this. Later on in the book of Acts, we have John and Peter who meet up with this guy who's crippled right in front of the temple. Now, the temple is not doing absolutely nothing for them. The temple is doing all its religious things, but it's not doing absolutely nothing for the cripple. Then comes John 
and Peter who are living and breathing the Midash. And he asked for money. I don't have silver, I have gold, but what I have, I'll give you in the name of Jesus Christ, what? Get up and walk. And this guy gets up. And what is the first thing that he does? He runs, jumping and and celebrating into the temple. That's the first thing he does. So we have this, this dynamic presence that moves. It's dynamic, invades darkness, transformative. And then Paul in 2 Corinthians tells us, chapter 6, that we are the temple and in us abides the living God. And so you and I are now the Mikdash. And so imagine church now. Church is not a building that we all go together and we sit and we, you know, church is you moving in different directions, going in different places, being the Mikdash at your work, at the university, at your studies, at school, at the time to... When, when you play, when you go to the beach, everywhere you go, you are Migdash. And so, and so when you think in those terms, you can see how invasive the presence of God and his message can be. Now, I present all this to you because I want you to understand that churches that shift from a temple mindset to a network mindset will be more effective in reaching this generation. The temple mindset is come to the temple. We're going to do stuff here, and you're supposed to come over here because over here is where we have the goods. The network mindset is saying, okay, let's go out there, and let's take the goods out there, and let's do house churches, small groups. Let's do gatherings. Let's do all sorts of, let's start invading the places where they are, where they go, the places that they like, and let's be present there, and let's be the mikdash right there, an invasive presence. Don't mess with me. Amen. I have to get an amen from you guys. Amen. Amen. Yeah. So, you know, we're talking about God's presence, and God's presence, it just moves. It's powerful. It moves from one direction, and it just just transforms it. And you are the, 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 the vehicle through which that power reaches other people. So if you tell me, well, pastor, I can't preach, I don't care. Yeah, pastor, pastor, I don't know how to give a Bible study. I don't care. Do you, what, what, what do you do? I, I'm very good with my hands. I, I, need, I like to work with wood. Well, that's your place. Start working with your wood. We had a pastor, and the way he introduced himself to his neighborhood, he just does salsa, salsa hot salsa. He's a Mexican, so he does hot salsa. And so he tells me, Peter, I went with my hot salsa, and I knocked on doors, and I started offering my hot salsa to everybody. And this one family said, we like this salsa, bring it again. And so I brought it again, and I kept on bringing it. I brought them to my house. We had dinner, and finally we had a Bible study. And after having a Bible study, they decided to get baptized. And now that whole family is going to church. It happened outside of the church. And notice the pastor didn't say, come with me to the church. He said, come to what? My house. You see, if we think in terms of us being the moving migdash, the, 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 the dynamic transformational presence of God moving around, no matter what you do, whatever you're good at, whatever your skill is, that is what God wants to use in order to reach people for Christ. Are you with me? Now, I'm bringing this to you because this is, is very, it, 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 it's foundational to understand how we can reach. And I'm using our assumptions to reach millennials. Because millennials really don't think the way I'm talking right now. But this is the way we reach them. We need to shift from an attractional model, secondly, to an incarnational model, Will, and and, and I, I, I misspelled that, will have the attention of this generation. An incarnational model will have the attention of this generation. It's, we will call it projects. And tomorrow I'm going to be talking about that, those things specifically, those projects, and how we can catch their attention in that way. But this generation is about causes. This generation is about getting their hands and their feet dirty. We can preach a thousand messages here. If we're not out there getting our hands and our feet dirty, it doesn't make sense to them. Now, I have to say, I'm a a seven-day Adventist. I'm a pastor. I love my church. I love my message. But I have to tell you, we as a people, we're more focused on information than on things that we do for the community and the people. 
And it's great to have the information. That's not, not, not negative, but, but we have to balance it out because we're, we're like very informational. So people to get into the church, they have to know all this information. And then if they accept all this information, then we can say, hey, you can come to the church and be part of our church. Let's baptize you. You see, if, if, you, if you look at the incarnational model, they basically belong before they believe. So we have had people in our churches who just come and they, they like hanging around with our churches, spend time, they listen to the sermons, they do acts of kindness outside, and like uh, six months later, they say, hey, um, I'm interested in getting baptized. Can you share your beliefs with me? You know, so I can, I kind of got a grasp on them, but can you just sit down and talk with me about them? And that's how they come to the church. We have people sometimes, in my, when I was pastor of churches, in my churches, I had people who would come participate and working with me. They were great volunteers, great volunteers who were working with in church services and church things that I had to do, and they were not Adventists yet. They were just testing us. They were just figuring it out. But for some reason, they just loved belonging to the crowd that we had there in our church. And one day, they would just come up to me and say, I need you to baptize me. I need you to baptize me. So let's sit down. Let's study. I want you to know what we're all about. And let's baptize you. I had one guy. One guy showed up one time. He just showed up. And he was like, I've been working with him for a long time. It, 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 like two years had passed. And one day he just shows up and says, hey, pastor, is the baptistry oh, uh, full? I'm like, no, why? I want to get baptized today. You need to baptize me right now. And so I look at my, I, I, I called up my, 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 my deacon. And I said, dude, we need the baptistry full. Fill it up, fill it up. I don't mess around with baptisms. You tell me you want to go down to the water, I'm going to bring you down to the water. And we bring you down to the water and we walk with you and teach you what it means to walk with Jesus. But that's a very special moment. So, so this generation is about projects, about causes. They want to get their hands dirty. They want to be involved before anything else. They want to belong before they believe. Um, churches that, open, that are open to a creative methodology, creative methodologies to accomplish mission using empirical Creativity. Let me explain what empirical creativity is. Empirical creativity means, and let me, let me explain it. Have you ever heard the, the expression out of the box? Like out of the box, you know? And, and people always say, we have to think out of the box. Well, there's a challenge. If the box is right here and I think way out of the box, the big problem is that I'm, I'm, I, ha- I, have, I have pushed myself away from reality. And so my creative thinking is going to, bring absolutely nothing. Nothing is going to be accomplished. And so empirical creativity lives, lives between living right there in the line where the box is and outside of the box. So it lives right in the middle. And so it says there's values in the box that we should not let go of. They're important and we need them as foundation in order to enjoy the creativity of what's outside of the box. Are you with me? Okay, so open to methodologies to accomplish mission using empirical creativity without becoming loose on doctrinal understanding will become more effective in reaching this generation. And I'll give you an example. We have a church um, in, in our conference who was doing health expos, and they started doing health expos all over, all over. And their purpose was they wanted people to be more healthier in their community. And they caught the attention of an NFL football team. Uh, it's a national football league team. And they're called the Redskins. And the Redskins gave them a phone call and said, hey, we're interested in you doing the health expo in our expo. And for two years, this church has done the health expo for the Redskins National Football League. You see, what happened there is that the community said, we know of these people, you know, and they're amazing people. And that's something that's very important. You have to earn, in this, in this generation, you have to earn your reputation. Just because you say, I'm Seventh-day I'm seven Adventist, I'm the true church, they're going to be like, good for you, man. You know, build up a sign and see if somebody follows you. <laughs> you know, that, that's what's going to happen. You have to earn your reputation. They really need to see that what you're saying has integrity with your actions with your words, with your life. You see, 
Are you a loving community? Are you people that embrace people? Can you walk a journey with somebody who's different than you? Can you you love and laugh and enjoy somebody who thinks differently and believes differently than you? Can you do those things, you know? And this is something I, I, I emphasize a lot in my church is I say, you know, we need to be in the community. We have to be such a positive presence that when people ask about a church, somebody in the community will say, I don't believe in God, but there's this church over there that's amazing. And I would go there any, if I would even got, I would, that's the church I would go to. You want people saying, you want people talking like that about your church. Because that same person who's saying that will one day join your church. You see? And so, so this, is, this is very important. You know, we have to look at creative methodologies in order to accomplish mission. And so I, I want to bring you to this right here. Um, right here we have... A very interesting, this, this is an evangelism continuum, but I want to utilize it in the context of this generation. You see, us Seventh-day Adventists, we're experts right here. That's the negative 2%. The negative 2% usually is in crisis. They're in some type of need. And our evangelistic meetings and our evangelistic approaches are excellent when it comes to this crowd. We bring them in. We bring them in. So I have nothing to tell you about that because you guys know how to do this already. We're very good right there. Where we're not very good is the negative 10%, negative 5%. We're absent from that arena. Almost absent, almost completely absent from that arena. And so here in the negative 10%, negative 5%, negative 5% are people who are seeking meaning. And usually in this generation, those who are seeking meaning are young families. Young families. A setting like this, they would love it. You know why? Because you're taking care of their children. And they're fascinated because they're going to go with their children and spend time there with their children while you guys are taking care of their children. This is a fascinating, you know, setting for them. Um, Then negative 10 are those who don't believe absolutely nothing. So no matter how many times you open the Bible, that, that book right there doesn't mean nothing to them. You see, what means to them is relationships. What means to them is my presence there. And so for people like this, in this case, this and right here, we usually do like 5Ks where we can, we actually don't do, actually, we don't reinvent the wheel because they have better activities and events than us. What we do is we go to them and we say, hey, I have 200 hands and 200 feet here at your disposal to be volunteers in your event. How can we help you? And they say, of course, come help us out. And we start creating a relationship with them. It's going to take some time. In one of our churches, we created a relationship with these, this crowd. And two years later, they asked us, what are Seventh-day Adventists, by the way? We love this area right here. We have fun in this church. And I've never been to a church, but we have fun in this church, even though we never do church here. But I want to ask you, what are Seventh-day Adventists? And we had the opportunity to then share, okay, this is who we are. You see? Relationships at negative 10. But the other part that we're still learning is the discipleship process, how people walk with God. In, in, in the past, this process was don't do this, do this. Don't do that, do this. Don't do this, do this. But it has to be more than that. What, is it, what does it mean to struggle with God? What does it mean when I have been a vegetarian all my life, I've been faithful to God all my life, and all of a sudden I get hit with cancer? And I ask the question, the question to God, why? And these are questions that millennials ask. What does it mean, you know, that we've been obedient in this way and it didn't work out that way? What what happened there? I did the to-do. I didn't do the to-don't. And it still didn't work out. So what happened here? And that's discipleship right here. What it means to wrestle with God and grow with God. And this is a powerful experience, you know. Um, So Ellen G. White she speaks to the hearts of millennials, and I want to share it. This, this is very well known by everybody. A great work of reform is demanded. It is only through the grace of Christ that the work of restoration, physical, mental, and spiritual can be accomplished. Christ's methods alone will give true success in reaching the people. We all know this, right? You guys all know this, right? It's been repeated. Now, notice what it says. The Savior mingled with man as one who desired their good. He showed them his sympathy for them, ministered to their needs, won their confidence. That's our strategic plan right there. 
That's a strategic plan right there. So, so, so this is something, this speaks very strongly to the millennials. We mingle with them before we judge them, before we, we point out to them, I'm a survivor. I'm, I'm, I'm the last, last piece of survivor, and I have a little bit of skin of millennial. And, and what happened with me is that this mingling, I remember in, 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 when I was growing up in church, it was not mingling at all. It was like, those people love rock. They're from the devil. You have to do away with them. Stay away from them. No mingling whatsoever. You see, the Savior mingled with people. He invaded their darkness. And as one who desired what? They're good. I want you to be happy. I want you to be peaceful. I'm going to walk with you. Incarnational methods. Walk with you. Be present with people. Learn them. What is their language? What is their culture? What are they thinking? What are their favorite places? What do they do? And, and then he showed them sympathy, and he ministered them, and, and he won their conferences. And then what happened? Then he bade them what? Follow me. At some point, the gospel is always going to make a person uncomfortable. It's going to make you uncomfortable. It's going to make a person uncomfortable. At some point, there's a make a move, an attempt, undertook, tried, sought. There's a moment where you have to say, would you like to give your life to Jesus? That needs to happen. There's an ass. The gospel is a big ass for a heart that's receiving it. Are you going to let go of the life you have and you're going to follow Jesus? You see, and all this makes sense in the millennial mind because this follows the millennial mindset. I love what she says here. There is need of coming close to the people by personal effort. If less time we're giving to sermonizing and more time we're spending personal ministry, greater results would be seen. Greater results would be seen. Notice, many have no faith in God and have lost their confidence in men, but they appreciate acts of, of sympathy and helpfulness. And as they see this, their hearts are touched. Gratitude springs up. Faith is kindled. They see that God cares for them. And as his word is open, they are prepared to listen and they follow. We had this one guy who was in a very stressful environment. His job was a very stressful environment. And his boss, every time he saw him, he was like, this guy is so peaceful. What is wrong with this guy? I mean, this is a very stressful environment. This guy is so peaceful, and I, I'm mad at him. And so he went over there. He says, what is it? What is it with you? Do you go to a church? He says, yeah, I go to a church. And he looked at him. He says, well, well then I want to go to your church. He didn't say nothing to his family. Started going to the church with him. All of a sudden, his wife and his children start looking at him after a few weeks and say, something has changed in our father. And the wife was saying, something has changed in my husband. I mean, this guy has the most stressful job ever. He would walk in here and he would yell at us and it was, it was chaos in this place. And now he's so loving, he's kind, something's going on. And they finally sat down, what is going on with you? And he said, I'm going to church. Well, why don't you take us with, with you? So now he takes his family. And they start going to this church. And the church, all of a sudden, they, they, they love the church and they get baptized. Now, let me tell you what this did to the church. The church was a very small little church where mission was not happening at all. And also this one guy, because he lived, he mingled. Suddenly they saw this and they were like, oh, we have to be part of this church. And suddenly, bam, the church was on fire on mission. They wanted to reach more people yet. You see, mingling. Being present, this is the mindset of the millennials. So, you see, even though they look different and they are different in many ways than us, these things are known to you and me. Am I right or am I wrong? They're known to you and me. Baking a pie to have some of your kids around and, and have them and just chat with them and laugh with them, even though you understand half of their jokes, we can do that. Can't we do that? Yeah, we can do that. You see, we can create safe places for our millennials to be present where they can have an environment where Christ can be lifted. And I don't have to put it down their throats. It's easy. It's natural. Am I making sense? Are you with me? Now, so we have to rethink our approach from monologue to dialogue, from, from, from this to dialogue, 
So let's sit down. Let's chat. Compelling proof to compelling story. It's not, remember the first, first example? It's not that I have the truth. It's let me share you the story. This is the narrative that I want to share with you. Presentation to conversation. Words to imagery. Use imagery. Our language to their language. Let me tell you something about our language. Do you know what haystacks are? Yeah. Is it, is, that's food for us, right? What is haystacks for the rest of the world? Uh, hey, let's go have haystack. What? I don't eat grass. <laughs> you know, they understand taco salad. Hey, let's have some taco salad. Okay, so we need to understand that we have a language that they're not used to. We have a culture that they're not used to, so we need to be sensitive. And when we talk with them, we don't use our, the language of our culture, but we use their language that they can understand what our culture is about. Does that make sense? You see? Um, Us, them, versus fellow travelers, fishing from the bank, swimming together. You know, um, believe to belong. And so when we move from believe to belong to belong before believing, we have to move from event-driven to context-driven. I don't know if you've been aware of this, but I know in states it's happening. I don't know over here in Australia, but have you noticed that your events are less attended? Have you noticed that those events that used to be crowded, and a lot of people used to come are, going, are dwindling down little by little, little by little. You know why? Because they're not interested in that no more. Because that is a mixture of event-driven and presentation. You know, somebody comes, talks to us, and we don't get to ask questions and dialogue and stuff like that. We're not doing industry. But context-driven is a place where let's sit together. Let's, let, let's make it a little bit smaller, and they will come. Let's chat. Let's talk. What do you have? What, what, this is what I have. This is what, what, what do you have? Let's, let's walk this together. Um, come and see to go and be to come and see. So a lot of them want to get involved in projects. They want to get their hands dirty before, before they hear about why there's 2,300 days. They, they, they want to they they enjoy the beauty of loving people in need and loving over them. And then they hear the rest of the context of the truth. Um, scripted to spontaneous, winning to nudging. Instead of you winning. I remember there was this, this, uh, the, these two guys, they used to tell me, Pastor, we, we, we saw a Jehovah Witness the other day and we gave him a Bible study. We asked him a big question and he couldn't answer it. And I said, what happened to him? He never came back. And so did you guys look for him? No, no, he didn't want to come back, so that's it. I'm like, well, you haven't done absolutely nothing. You know, it's, it's not winning, it's saving. It's bringing someone to Jesus. And sometimes, instead of winning, we, we, we have to start using nudging. And gospel presentation to gospel experience. And I know experience kind of breathes fear in the hearts of people. It's nothing different. You know the gospel experience is one person encounters Jesus. It's creating that environment for them to encounter the Savior. And so that's, we have to move from that. So so understanding the the demographics. Millennials are products of their culture as well as influencers. So these guys, these guys are products of their culture because it it formed them, but also they're influencing their culture. They're they're changing it, you know. And and Facebook is is a good example of that. Twitter is a good example. Snapchat is a good example of that. These these products, it was just a product, and all of a sudden it started, it, it created a culture. And now all of us, almost all of us here are hooked up on Facebook, and it's interesting because I, I go everywhere and I, I always see somebody on Facebook checking all oh, these are the pictures, you know, the rest, blah, blah, blah. Everybody's in, on Facebook. So it, is, it shapes. Noticeable for, the multi, for their multiculturalism, these people, it's not about toler, uh, tolerance. It's about acceptance. And when we use hate words against that, the things that we fear, that turns them off a lot. They're sensitive subjects that we don't speak about a lot. And they're sensitive subjects when it comes to um, uh, tattoos, when it comes to the LGBT community, and so on. These are sensitive subjects for them. And if we treat those subjects with hate words, they're not going to listen to us no more. Remember, the Savior, the Savior mingled, desired the good of people. He showered them with sympathy. He ministered to their needs. And then he bade them what? Follow me. 
And it takes spiritual maturity to walk through these areas and bless people. And um, I, 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 what, what's my time? I'm running out of time. So, but I need to share this story so you can understand what I'm trying to say. Um, I had a church who, uh, you know, we had only 70 people coming to our church, and we started praying, Lord, you know, what are you going to do? And my head elder was the one who opened the door for something amazing that happened. We had 20 people from the community every Sabbath coming to our church. Our church grew from 70 all the way up to 480 people. It was amazing what God was doing there. And it had nothing to do with this person. It had everything to do with our leadership, what they were doing. It was just amazing what God was doing through them. And one day, one person came up to me and says, Peter, are you willing to preach in a church other than this church? I said, yeah, I preach anywhere. Would you preach on a Sunday? I'll preach any day. Will you preach in a Sunday church? I will preach in a Sunday church. Where is the Sunday church? I'll go to it right now. Pastor, it's a lesbian, a homosexual church like we say over here and and I say take me there and so I went there and I preached and I preached the gospel and I walked in and they had pews they had an organ it was a high church they were singing hymns those hymns I knew I sang with them and I sat down and all of a sudden the lady comes and says hey come with me and I go with her I go around she stands in front of the people and she says your turn she sits down I'm like okay this is how they do it. And so I preached. I, I shared my message. After I shared my message, um, I was done and I was walking and, and all these women surrounded me and they say, we, we have some questions to ask you. And I say, what are the questions? You know, um, what do, you, um, do you preach like every week? And I'm like, yeah, I preach every week. Do you, what day? On Sabbaths or Saturdays as you, as you guys know it. You see, language, Sabbath, that's ours. Saturday, they understand that. And so I'll say, yeah, Saturdays. I preach Saturdays. At what time? Around 11.15. Where? And I told them, this is where I preach, you know. And they said, thank you. And they all left. That was it. They didn't say goodbye or nothing. They just left. Next Sabbath, they were there in the last pew, all sitting there. The Savior mingled, mingled desired their good, ministered to their needs. And so we, they started coming every single Sabbath. Of course, I didn't tell the church I didn't, tell, I didn't tell the church was not ready yet. But that, 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 should, be, that should be sad for us. Because what is church for? Millennials are looking at that, by the way. What is church for? You know, is it for only perfect people or people who get it? Or is it for all messed up people coming in and the people who are getting it can say, hey, I was there, let's, let's walk together. Millennials are looking at that. Our assumptions. Are you with me? And so here they are. Here, here they are. They're coming to church and they're, they love it. They're, they're spending time. Every Sabbath they're with us. And, and, and a, an event happened in one of them and they moved out and, and a, a group went. But this one stayed with us. And she kept on staying. One day she said, Pastor, I want to meet with you. And she met with me. She says, Pastor, I've decided to break up with my partner because of what the Bible teaches me. She was crying like crazy. I could not understand her pain. I don't know what that is. But it was very, I saw her pain. Her pain was real. And I have to be sensitive to that pain. Are you with me? It's not that I approve. I'm sensitive to their needs. Millennials are looking at that. Are we sensitive? It's not that... Let me tell you something about the millennials. The millennials respect that we have a position, that we believe in the doctrines that we believe. They respect that. What is difficult for them is our sensitivity towards the rest of the people of the world. And so we need to be sensitive. And I listened to her story, and, and we started walking with her, and a year later we had the opportunity to baptize her. It was fascinating. It was awesome. And she, she chose my birthday for baptism. I say, thank you for the birthday gift. That's awesome. Love it. So notice, they're tech savvy. Mobile tech is closest to their heart. I think for, for all of us, it's becoming that too. Um, social generations, they're a very social generation. Uh, the ones they, they social, notice this, and this is a great opportunity. The ones that they socialize the most with are their parents. 
get that. The parents are still the number one influencers if you look at it in the right context. But you have to create a safe place for them to be. That safe place is very important. Cooperative and collaborative. They are looking for adventure, passionate about values, incredibly passionate about values. And we can talk about all of these in, in very in individual ways. Now, guess who's a superstar for the millennials? You guys had no idea. James White is a superstar for the millennials. They think James White has a nice fashion. <laughs> Did you guys know that? <laughs> they love his beard. <laughs> he became as one of the fashion guys for the millennials, for the hipsters. Um, amazing. Our James White, go guy. And so demographics include... Not only what's on paper, and that's what we saw, what's on paper, but it also includes us being physically there. We need to experience what this culture is all about, what's this generation. We need to see, we need to observe, we need to spend time with them. We have to mess up and go in there and spend time with them and talk with them and chat with them and see and, and be uncool and be the old person in the crowd. Uh, in order for us to understand their context so we can reach them in a more effective way. So this is, this is the practical part, and we have just a few minutes. Um, I think we have eight minutes for this. And so I want, you to, I want you to think. I want you to help me out here. Now, according to the demographics, we looked at the demographics. I shared with you some demographics of, of millennials. List three training events that your church would need in order to minister to the millennials. Anybody care to venture? IT, IT training. So tech training, how to understand that world. Okay, what else? Where they teach us the IT. So the teacher, the presenter would be a millennial. Cool. What else? What, kind, what, else, what other kind of training? Yeah. Language, use of language. We're going to language does this millennial culture utilize? And I would add to language is culture. What is the millennial culture about, you know? Understanding that. If we, if we really want to reach this generation and we don't want to lose them, and let me tell you something, we are losing very seriously this generation. If we really want to lose them, we need to seriously take in consideration and say, okay, church, we're going to train to understand this generation so we cannot lose the ones that we have and reach the ones that we don't have. Yes. Raising our standards. What do you mean by that? Exactly. How do we raise our standards? Small steps are very important. Small steps are very important. Uh, we just had the other days, we had an event for, for millennials. We, we call it Open Forum with Leadership. And we made one mistake. We tried to get a female on the panel, and we couldn't find a female that would say yes to us. And so at the day, we, we had all the guys there. And of course, they stood up. Where are the females? Where is the inclusiveness? You see? Where is acceptance? That was the, they, they asked us the question immediately. So they told me, I remember they told me very clearly, Peter, it's the first step. It's okay. <laughs> that was their grace and mercy towards me. Okay, that's awesome. Check out these. Uh, we, have, we have a topic, how to have spiritual conversations with secular people. And my presenter here is Clint Iswood. So he's, he's going to be a representative. You guys know who Clint Eastwood is? Yeah? Okay, but he's, he, this is just a mock, okay? So don't believe he's going to give us that. So we have another, another one is what is a millennial? A lot of us need to understand what is a millennial. Another one is what are the true values of millennials and why? What are the true values of millennials and why? You know, why do they feel that way? Why do they believe this way? It's a good way. Uh, list three relational projects. Now that we have our trainings... What projects can we do? Help me out. Personal work. So what personal? So, so you're asking my question. What kind of projects? Soup kitchens. There we go. What else? Community gardening work. That's a big thing because they're into health. They're really into health. If there's, a, if there's a crowd that will listen to the health message we have, this is the crowd. 
They're really into health. What else? Parent groups. Very good, parent groups. Environmental issues, very important. Yes? Small groups, very important. Very important. It's great, great stuff. Okay, so projects. I, I chose international, uh, int intentional acts of kindness. Uh, you know, one of the things that I found out is, you know, I, I see a group of millennials, and they're from my church. I say, here's $500. Go and be kind to this community. And they figure it out. They're creative. They know how to think. They're intelligent. These people have a lot of information. They have learned a lot of stuff that we didn't learn at a certain age. And they're already processing, and they're learning something else. So these kids are intelligent, you know. Uh, street improv. You know, they, they like to share. They, remember selfies? You know the selfies? Uh, the, 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 the psychology, and I'm, I'm going to be very simplistic in my psychology here. The psychology behind that is I want to be noticed, you know. Um, and so street improv is very good. Mission trips. Mission trips. Now, we have to understand, mission trips that just touch base and then leave and see you later forever are not the mission trips we're talking about here. The mission trips that we're talking about here that they're interested in is mission trips that really make a difference in that community that we're reaching. That means that it's a mission that stays with that community for at least three to four years. We did something over in Peru, Iquitos, Peru. We went to Iquitos, Peru. And right there we brought our people. And we were excited because we were going to make this huge drill. And we started talking with the community. The community told us, if you do a huge drill, it's going to be a big mistake. Nobody wants, knows how to fix that. Uh, we, we would have to pay for the water. People would have to come far away to pay for water and pay for taxis to come here. It's going to be a mess. So we said, this is a bad idea. And we were frustrated. All of a sudden, we found this, this PhD student who was studying water systems and had developed a water system this, this big. And it only cost $29.95. And we told her, how about we refund you? She was not Adventist, but she was doing something that was amazing. And we as a church, we said, let's not reinvent the wheel. It's right in front of us. Can we partner with you? We'll fund you. Let's get a village with these things. And she went, she did the study, she picked the village, and it only cost us $5,000. And we filled all the village. Every house had a water filter. A year later, a year later, praise God, a year later, I'm talking to the guys, and they say, you know, Peter, the doctor, the doctor of the area says that out of 60 cases of stomach illness that we used to have here, we're down to two. Amen. Making change in the community. Because that change says, we really love you. You see what that means? You see that what it means? And so, so that, that, that's the type of thing that millennials are looking at. That's what they want. Do you know how to do that? Yes, you do. You've been doing it for years. All these things that I'm talking to you about, you've been doing it for years. It's you have to just put it in the right context and create a safe place so they can be ministered to. So I'm using our assumptions in order to reach a generation that we don't know really how to talk to them. You see? One of the beautiful things is this one. This God encounters. This, anybody can, can tell me, God encounters can be a reaping event. It can be a, a spiritual retreat. It can be all those things. Let me, let me share. We can retreat small groups, small events. That's what God encounters are. Let me surprise you with something. This generation, millennials, if you think that they don't like the Bible or they like the Bible watered down, you are wrong. They like solid theology. Last night, I was sharing theology with high school kids. And they were eating it up. They like theology. But you need to present. It's not proof texting for them. It's the story. It's the narrative. It's the, it's the theology behind it. And that excites them because when the, when the word becomes alive in their eyes, they're like, wow, they're just like sal salivating. They're like, yes, give me more. They love it. And, and, this, is, and this, this, this encounter with the word of God makes them see Jesus deeper. And also it starts making sense why God says, hey, follow me in this and follow me in this and follow me in this. It starts making sense in their head. 
You see? So these God encounters are important. This is the part where we say, and he bathed them, follow me. This is where we say, hey, follow me. Come with me. Possible leaders for this? All these leaders need to be relational, highly relational and creative. That doesn't mean that they're super disorganized. They're organized, but they have to be highly relational because the secret sauce for the millennial generation is, oh, and I I couldn't go through it. I'll do that tomorrow. Um, The secret sauce for this generation is is relationships. That's the secret sauce. And I'm going to... I'm going to invade your time a little bit because my time is off. Um, let me share you something. Guy, this, this guy, he's 55 years old. He's in my church, right? His wife comes up to me and says, Peter, I'm putting Brad to be the teacher for the teenagers. And I'm like, what? No, no. It, no. There's no connection. There's like several generations of no connection there. He's not going to even find the plug. It's too, it's too much. And he's like, and she looks at me and she says, well, do you have somebody else? (laughs) She was was like a sergeant. You know, I had to to watch myself with her. She said, do you have somebody else? I'm like, I don't have nobody else, but I I, I don't think this is a good idea. She said, we're we're putting Brad. I'm like, okay, Brad there. Brad, the next thing that Brad does, he sits down with me. He says, Peter, I have no idea what I'm doing. I know. And, and he sits down with me, and, and we start talking and chatting at, at, at possible things he can do, and we start looking for materials and things like that. The guy starts, he starts with four teenagers, four teenagers. In four months, he was up to 45 teenagers in his class. Many of them were non-Adventists coming from the streets. Suddenly, we had issues with gangs and drugs at a church, because they were coming to listen to the word. And I was like, Lord, I, I welcome the problem, but you have to help me with this problem. <laughs> you know, uh, it's awesome. You know, and he, what, what he did, he catered to what they were needing. He, he, he brought them relation. He took, he would take them every Wednesday to their, his house. He would feed them. He had a lot of food on Wednesday. And those kids would eat like crazy. And they would spend time studying the Bible. And suddenly one of them said, can we take all this knowledge and put it into practice and do something out in the community? And so they did. They started doing things in the community. And one of the things that they did a lot, they started serving homeless. They, 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 they felt a great passion for homeless people. And they even started preaching to them. They became the preachers for the homeless people. And they were making altar calls and, and homeless people were coming to Jesus. It was amazing what was happening. And I was just looking at Brad. Brad, by the way, is, he, was, he was a farmer. And when Brad would sit down with me, he, he, the conversation, I, would, I, had to, I had to bring some life into the conversation where I would get bored. Because <laughs> he would speak, yeah, Peter, you know. Uh, uh, and I'm like, yeah, 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 okay, okay. What, what are you getting to, Brad? <laughs> but this guy, 55 years old, he, he, he figured it out. He says, I'm just going to love on them. I'm going to create a safe place for them and let them shine. And whatever their passion is, I'm going to follow that and keep them in God. That's all Brad did. And amazing things. We have, from that group, we have students that are graduating from medical degrees that are going to become missionaries. It's a possibility. God bless you greatly. Uh.